need to find shelter soon, Siona. The storm is getting worse. Look, there's a small castle up ahead. Let's see if we can find shelter there. Oh, and to think that I didn't expect any visitors today. Excuse us, sir, but we were caught in the storm and we need a shelter until it passes. May we stay here for a while? Of course. Please, come in. <sighs> Thank you for your hospitality, sir. You can call me Alexander. Let me get you a cup of warm wine to chase away the chill. I don't have a good feeling about this man. Oh, you rarely have a good feeling about any man. He is odd. I don't know if by odd you mean oddly handsome. <laughs> what? <sighs> Come on, everything will be fine. We are not staying long. Just till the storm passes and then we get the hell out of here. Okay, but don't drink or eat anything he gives us until I say it's safe, okay? Okay, okay, now shh, he's coming. I must say, it's rare to see travelers in this part of the land. It's always so dark here. What brings two young beautiful women out in the dark like this? Oh, we're adventurers, making our way back to the nearest city. Ah, adventurers. Fascinating. I've heard that adventurers love stories. Is that true? Well, I can't speak for all adventurers, but I'm certainly the one who loves a good tale. <laughs> I'm a bard, after all. Ah, a bard. Your finely crafted harp speaks volumes. It seems I've caught the interest of someone who truly appreciates a good story. In that case, I'd be delighted to share with you a tale of darkness and intrigue, if you're willing. I'm not sure if that's... Ah, oh, that sounds wonderful. We'd love to hear a story. Our tale begins in a distant land, in the majestic yet shadowed kingdom of Barovia. There lived a noble warrior named Strad von Zarovich, a man of great power and ambition. He was a conqueror, a master of the battlefield, and a ruler of his people. But even the mightiest of men have their weaknesses. Strad had a younger brother named Sergei, a man of striking beauty and kindness. Everything Strad was not. One fateful day, Sergei brought a beautiful young lady to the palace, a woman named Tatiana. She was to be his bride. And her beauty was unparalleled, her grace unmatched. But as Strad looked upon Tatiana, he felt a longing he had never known before. He fell deeply in love with her, a love that twisted his soul with envy and despair. Strad was a man of years, hardened by war, while Tatiana was youthful and full of life. He knew she would never look at him with the same affection she held for his brother. Driven by his desire and jealousy, Strad sought a way to claim Tatiana for himself. In his desperation, he made a pact with the dark powers, ancient and malevolent forces that promised him eternal life and youth in exchange for his soul. On the night of Sergei and Tatiana's wedding, Strad enacted his terrible plan. As the celebrations reached their peak, Strad struck. He murdered Sergei, his own blood in cold betrayal. With Sergei's blood on his hands, he sought out Tatiana, hoping she would accept him now that his brother was gone. But Tatiana, Horrified and heartbroken by the monstrous act, 
fled from Strahd's grasp. In her despair, Tatiana threw herself from the balcony, preferring death over a life with Strahd. As she fell, the mists of Barovia rose to claim her, and Strahd was left with nothing but an eternity of torment. The Dark Powers had fulfilled their promise. He was immortal, but at a terrible cost. Strahd became the Lord of Barovia, his soul forever bound to the land. He was cursed to live an eternal existence, waiting for Tatiana's soul to be reborn. Throughout the centuries, he encountered her reincarnation many times, each time hoping to win her love. But fate was cruel, and he always lost her, one way or another. And so, Strad von Zarovich, the Dark Lord of Barovia, continues his endless search, trapped in a cycle of love and loss. His dark desire and despair echoing through the ages. He waits in his castle, ever watchful, ever yearning, a shadow over the land of Barovia. Wow, that was such an amazing story. Are you a bard too? Uh, Lovett, we need to leave. Now. What? But why? Oh, leaving so soon. I have many more stories to tell. No, thank you. We need to go. I insist you stay. The storm is still raging outside. Lovett, we have to go. Trust me on this. I'm... I'm sorry, Mr. Alexander, but... We really need to go. Thank you so very much for your hospitality. It was really splendid, I mean. I can't let you leave. You see, guests are so rare here, and I've grown quite fond of your company. What do you mean? Let us go. I'm afraid I must insist. You see, I too have a secret. One that I'd rather not reveal, but you've left me no choice. <laughs> A vampire! Lovette, run! Outside! We need to teleport! Do it! Quickly! enough. What the hell was that? A vampire drinking blood. I've heard of Strat and his kind before. We were lucky that we escaped. Wait, you mean the tale is real? Pretty real. I don't know much about it, but... <laughs> you really thought you would escape? I always find what I seek. Let her go! Look, Solace, defending us. Thank you, Siona. That, that was incredible. When did you learn to do that? It's a new ability I've been learning to use. It channels the power of the sun into a focused beam of light. I'm really glad it worked. <sighs> Me too. <sighs> Let's get out of here. I've had enough spooky stories for one night. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the B&D Podcast. We are here tonight on this gloomy, dreadful night to discuss something that makes our blood boil. And of course, after that intro, you have probably guessed right. We will discuss about vampires and more specifically about the ultimate hot piece known as Strad von Zarovich. We are delighted and petrified to welcome our two dear friends, Yanni Suerev 
And John, Hello, guys. as veteran DMs of the Ravenloft campaign specifically, since me and Zephy both had the pleasure to get our hearts torn to pieces by them and their Ravenloft playthroughs. So we're so happy that they're joining us today to talk about all things dark and twisted. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hello. So uh, just a quick mes- mention before we begin. Uh, whatever we are going to discuss here about the setting and campaign is not what is genuinely right or wrong, even though I don't think there is a wrong way to play D&D, but it is from the perspective of two DMs who have played this in their own unique ways and styles, and that's what we discuss here today. But before we begin, I would really like to give a big shout out to Jay Rolf for giving his voice to Alexander the Vampire in today's episode. He did such an amazing job portraying the character, and we can't thank him enough for his contribution to the episode. We will insert all his information down in the description box, so go and check him out. Good. So since it's Halloween season... Let's dive into the lore, the complex and intricate characters, and the darkness of this campaign setting. There will be spoilers, so be prepared. Let's start with our first question. And I think I'm going to start first, um, Zephy, if that's okay? Yeah, of course. Go on. Okay. So, what is Ravenloft, and who is really Strad von Zarevich? Tell us a bit about him. Okay, so... Uh, Ravenloft is a gothic horror campaign setting centered around the concept of dread and uh, generally feeling trapped. Uh, that's for the classic uh, D&D setting uh, for 2nd uh, edition and 3.5. Uh, the plane that uh, the setting takes place is called uh, the Dim Plane of Dread and it's ruled by malevolent entities called uh, the Dark Powers. So, uh, Strad von Zarwitz is the first of all the Dark Lord inside the Ravenloft, and uh, it's a lead spin character to the overall meta plot. He's a vampire who rules Barovia, the heart of Ravenloft, and is cares to eternally replace his tragic obsession with his lost love, Tatiana. Uh, Strad's curse traps him in a loop where he can never possess her, and no matter how many times he's uh, reincarnated, he just fails. Uh, he's a brilliant uh, strategist, uh, very manipulative, uh, very charming, and embodies uh, much of the tortured soul trope. Okay, the only things I want to add is that Trad was the general from the two brothers, Strad and Sergei Vonjarovic, and he was a middle-aged man who happened to fall in love with a much younger lady named Tatiana Kolyanova, I think. So he's not just the vampire and the BBG. He has a human side also. He does? At least Maybe. he shows that he shows <laughs> that he does. He has a very fragile ego, to be, to be more precise. Uh, he just can't accept that he, he can't possess Tatiana. And he's a Scorpio. <laughs> Probably. When I was running Curse of Strad, I was searching in the Reddit and there was a comment that I didn't really understood it at that time, and uh, still don't understand it, but I'm looking forward to understand when I'm 40. It was that uh, you can understand Strad until you are 40. I would like to continue and uh, ask the next question. We know a few things about Strad, but I wonder what other important characters are in this campaign, and why are they so important? Talking about the uh, case of Strad, Apart from the Vampire Lord, uh, there are several other key figures in Barovia, such as Irina Koliana, the latest incarnation of Tatiana, which is a very central figure in to uh, Strad's obsession. Then uh, there is uh, Madame Eva, the Vistani seer who often acts uh, to guide adventurers, providing insights through her tarot card readings. And uh, another key figure for Curse of Strad is definitely Rudolf van Richten, who is a scholar of the supernatural calamities that plague Ravenloft. Also, outside the campaign Curse of Strad, I think a very important character is Azalin Rex, who is uh, the main antagonist of uh, Strad in the general uh, metaplot. He's a lich dark lord that rules over Darkon, which is the northmost uh, domain of Ravenloft mainland, and uh, it's one of the biggest domains. 
Okay, that's nice. John, have you got any favorite characters? Another important character in Gers of Strad, uh, in my opinion, is uh, Rahadin, who is uh, more sane and more insane than Strad. He is the right hand of Strad, and uh, uh, I have portrayed him uh, more important than he is in the written Gers of Strad, because he adds more depth to Strad and to the elves in the Barovia. But why is that? Who is Rahadin, and why is he so important? To the Lord. Rahadin is the general of Strad. Uh, they fought together the great war in the Strad's uh, past. And also, spoiler alert, he is the main character in one of the background of Barovia for the elves and has something to do with their cat and ears. I don't think I want to know more. Um, <laughs> That's but... brutal, to be yeah, honest. It's, it's, quite, it's quite dark. Um, but what about you, Yanis? Have you got any favorite character and why are they so... Uh, we're talking about Gears of Strahd or uh, Ravenloft in general? Ravenloft in general. Yeah, so I am really fond of fiends in uh, Ravenloft. You can uh, portray them... Uh, no, you should portray them as uh, any other mortal character as they are prisoners of the Dark Powers as well. And one can view them as just any normal person uh, to the general power struggle, politics, and desire to escape Ravenloft. One such fiend is uh, the infamous Gentleman Caller. Uh, he is, uh, or it is, a very powerful and manipulative uh, incubus that is striving to, fu to fulfill a sinister prophecy in hopes to unravel the foundations of uh, the Demiplane. His uh, goal is to ultimately escape, but that's up to debate. So they come from Ravenloft, these fiends? No, uh, they are from the. They are outsiders. Uh, they may come from the abyss. Oh. They may come from Forgotten Realms, okay. just like they any were just, other character. They were just summoned in the Ravenloft. Uh, yeah, some of them were snatched by the mist, some of them uh, were summoned, some of them uh, were chosen by the Dark Powers to further their, their plots. It's really up to their backstory or the DM's backstory. And you say they're, they are prisoners, and in Curse of Strad, you practically you are also a prisoner when you uh, go into Bar Barovia, let's say. Is there any way they can escape? Not really. Um, they might think there is a way to escape, but the reality is that uh, the, o the only person who can escape is the one that uh, the Dark Powers deem so. Probably not then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if sometime in the lore the Dark Powers deemed anyone to escape uh, Ravenloft. Yeah, in, yep. in many instances. For who? Uh, okay, one character that escaped uh, Ravenloft and Barovia is Yander, the main protagonist from the book uh, Vampires of the Mist, which I totally recommend. And he found a way to escape Barovia. Probably the only way to escape Barovia is to redeem yourself and to follow the light. Yeah, that. redemption uh, seems to be something that uh, the Dark Powers don't really want in Ravenloft, yet it's uh, very important. So one might say that uh, the Dark Powers uh, fabricate hope. Mm -hmm. And another character that managed to escape uh, was uh, Lord Soth, uh, Death Knight, a very famous character from uh, the Greyhawk setting. He just uh, didn't play in, uh, in the Dark Powers uh, chessboard. Uh, he sat in his castle, he was cursed, he was uh, sad about his uh, life, and he just didn't do much. So the Dark Powers deemed him uh, not worthy to be a Dark Lord, and they sent him back to his uh, home plane. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So the Dark Powers want content in order to keep Exactly, you... exactly. They are... Uh... They are really unfathomable. You can't really know what the Dark Powers want. They want content, but not good-natured content. <laughs> they want to. They want you to suffer. They want you to try and still fail and try again. 
and fail again and keep doing this forever. Lovely. Lovely. That's that's great. Uh, John, you said earlier that an important character is Rahadin. Is he also your favorite character? Uh, apart from Strad, probably yes, he is my favorite character. Especially in how we played the uh, Curse of Strad. He was, uh, he had a very important role and uh, he tailored a quite bit of the story. So um, I have a funny story to share actually about one particular character. When the Curse of Strad campaign started, I was living in another city and I couldn't play with the guys. But uh, John kept me updated on how the story was unfolding with the group. So one night they were about to enter the death house, if you remember, Yannis. Yeah, I do. <laughs> a haunted house where they would encounter two little kids, a girl and a boy. What was their names? I don't remember. Thorn and... Um, Rose. Thorn and Rose. Rose, yeah. Thorn and Rose, yeah. Thorn and Rose. And they were calling for help. So to make it spookier, uh, John turned off the lights, lit some candles and played creepy ambient music. I suggested that he called me a few minutes before the session started and put me on speakers. I wouldn't speak, so the guys wouldn't know that we were on a call. When the time came and Ron described hearing a girl screaming, I would start screaming in my creepiest voice, and we were both excited about the idea, so we went ahead with it. So once Ronan mentioned the little girl, I began screaming, help us, please help us, and the guys completely lost their minds. Um, one friend of ours was so terrified that he ran into another room cursing and then came back to watch puppy videos to help him calm down. <laughs> and it was it was great. We all laughed so hard afterwards. But, you know, you got the spooky vibe, right? You got the concept. Uh, sometimes you have to improvise. I think this is going to be the line for this episode. Improvise, adapt, overcome. Exactly. <laughs> After that, communication is the key. Yeah. Improvise, adapt, overcome. <laughs> Another question is, as DMs running this campaign, what is it exactly about Raven Love that makes it such an interesting pick to run? John, do you want to go first? Yes, it's a totally different campaign from the other campaign books that Wizards of the Coast have published. It has a gothic vibes. It's uh, quite spooky, but... Uh, it's not an epic campaign. It's more of a moral campaign. It probably like Descent into Avernus, but uh, I generally prefer more the Curse of Strad. It makes the the best and the worst out of you. What about you, Yanis? So, uh, for me, uh, what makes uh, Ravenloft unique is the fact that the nature of the demiplane is uh, quite ambiguous. To what I uh, to that I mean uh, that. Uh, both in the sense of in-game scholarship, meaning uh, the understanding of uh, various organizations and individuals in regards to religion, magic, and even uh, how time exists in their perceptive reality, as well as uh, how a DM can manipulate these mechanics as a storytelling tool. So uh, there is this concept in uh, Ravenloft called uh, false history. In Ravenloft, the concept of false history is one of those unique mechanics and unsettling elements. The dark powers uh, that control the demiplane of dread have the ability to fabricate entirely false pasts for both the domains they create and the beings that are trapped within them. That's why there is this notion that uh, in Ravenloft uh, most of the souls are empty. So, uh, when a Dark Lord is drawn into Ravenloft and their domain is uh, formed around them, the Dark Powers often create a very detailed and completely fictitious backstory for that domain. This false history is woven uh, seamlessly into the fabric of the land, its uh, culture and its inhabitants. The people within the domain believe in this uh, history as if it were real, even though it might only have existed for a very short time. Like a um, hundred years, uh, they might have lived in reality one year or even some hours. So a literal brainwashing. Yeah, exactly. Oh my! And that's for every DM to to play around with. I think it's a very very interesting tool and aspect of the Ravenloft campaign setting. It sounds so different from what everything else is, basically. So it's actually so cool. I just want to add 
that it's the only campaign that betrays the eternal battle between uh, light and darkness, hope versus despair, sacrifice and redemption versus eternal torture. So these are the concepts that make the, the campaign very interesting. And especially for the new DMs, you can tailor them to fit to your campaign and don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. I am a bit afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to ask you next, is there something that people need to be careful about when running this campaign setting? Oh, um, yeah. Quite a few things, actually. Uh, the tone can easily turn grim and overwhelming, so it's very important to maintain balance. Um, too much despair can drain the player's enthusiasm, so having a mix of moments of hope, humor or even lighter encounters can provide the very necessary breather. Another thing to consider is uh, consent regarding uh, darker themes, uh, because some elements of the story can be intense, so having an open dialogue with your players beforehand is crucial to ensure everyone is comfortable and having fun. I totally agree with Yanis. Don't overdo it, because the players may... may feel that they can do nothing, there is no hope, and there is no point to continue the campaign. So always keep it balanced. Like real life, then. (laughs) There is no hope. (laughs) Probably, yes. (laughs) Or there is only hope. Only hope. Okay, that was enlightening. But I was wondering, what is your favorite area of Barovia and why? Uh, my favorite area of Barovia was Valaki because uh, it's where you actually feel the struggle of Barovia. You start to understand that everyone wants to get saved, to get redeemed. But for some reason, everyone has a wrong way how to bring uh, the light in Barovia, how to fight Strad. Every character want the best for Valaki, for Barovia, for the whole place. But everyone's way always leads to wrong, uh, to disastrous outcomes. So that's why it's a very interesting place and my favorite place. And you should meet the Burgomaster. He's a lovely guy, but he has a thing with masks of the head of the horses, which is... uh, a legit punishment in medieval times. He was really delusional. <laughs> but he wanted the best. <laughs> yeah. What about Let's you, Yanis? I'm really fond of uh, the village of Barovia itself. Um, it's where players uh, first step into the mists and they get the initial taste of the oppressive atmosphere and the otherworldly environment. Um, the desolate streets, the ever-present feeling of being watched and the broken spirits of the townsfolk uh, tend to set the perfect tone for the campaign. I totally agree with Yanis. And in the cemetery of the village of Barovia, you can see the previous adventurers that tried to kill uh, Strad von Zarovic, still marching till this day for the Castle Ravenloft, which really makes you feel what this place really is. Oh, I love that. I think as, to... as everyone probably has already guessed, the themes of this campaign are quite intense, <laughs> mature and dark. <laughs> That's true. But they're also very awesome. They're, I don't know. They're, they're intense. Can... Intense, intense can be good as well. It's not just like a exactly. negative Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Where did you get your inspiration from in order to set the tone and mood while you were running this campaign setting? Um, I draw a lot of inspiration from classic Gothic horror literature. Um, Bram Stoker, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, as well as uh, dark fantasy anime and manga such as uh, Berserk, Made in Abyss, Claymore or uh, Vampire Hunter D, and also music uh, Play uh, has a very important uh, role to play in the general atmosphere. So, classical music to death metal. <laughs> With these animals you have mentioned, I yeah. feel like I'm twenty 
kilos heavier <laughs> because they're they're so heavy these animes oh yeah 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 animes. the themes are uh, very extreme uh, not f- for the faint of heart yeah not for everyone but they're amazing they're amazing they're masterpieces but you need to have the guts the guts yeah. to see it <laughs> <laughs> the guts <laughs> yeah they are uh, very grotesque sometimes and uh, disgusting <laughs> are your campaigns also disgusting Sometimes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, they tend to be. I like the darker side of uh, the gothic horror experience and the horror in general. Mm-hmm. What about you, John? Uh, I totally recommend the Aistrad, Memoirs of a Vampire, and the Vampire of the Mists, the two books about Ravenloft, and also about series. I think I'm going to recommend Penny Dreadful, and especially the composer of the music of the series. Sorry if I mispronounce it. Abel Korzianowski. Yeah, sounds right. Sounds about right. Uh, has the perfect tone and mood for quite spooky, but also hopeful Kers of Strad. I love your suggestions. I love the novels, and I love Penny Dreadful, and... I love all these concepts. They're so amazing. Especially the endings of the both books uh, that I mentioned earlier. You can actually feel the eternal torture from the first book, I Strad, that uh, Strad von Zarovit feels and lives on. And the redemption from the second book for uh, another vampire who finally succeeds to escape the mists of Barovia. Do you remember Castlevania? Yep, I didn't like it. Yeah, that's yeah. another uh, another discussion. Do you remember Lenore, the redhead vampire? The only one I remember from Castlevania is a vampire with white hair, and that's it. The, her sister, Lenore. Okay. Yeah, remember I remember her. her. Yeah, I, I think that Vampire of the Mists, the ending was kind of the same with Lenore's ending in Castlevania. Way to tone down. Yeah, but... I think uh, in Castlevania, it's uh, it was kind of uh, uncalled for for her to die like that. As of uh, the general plot, I I didn't really like it. I think uh, the characters uh, were too intelligent like... <laughs> to do the things that they did the way they did it. I don't know. I, I like the concept. You know, if I don't want to spoil anything now. The ending scene of Lenore is a vampire with this ending I mean yeah it's kind of redeemed and I don't know it, it has a flavor I like it then you will like uh, the ending of the vampire of the beast uh, 100 and spoiler alert more. yeah okay we have a fanboy here <laughs> yep guilty <laughs> tricky question what are the mists of Barovia since we're talking about the mists and the dark powers and everything. Uh, what are the mists of Barovia? And do you think that there is a way to actually leave Barovia as an adventurer? Um, as uh, mentioned before, I think uh, that leaving Barovia is uh, really up to the, <laughs> the dark powers and uh, up to the DM. But uh, about the mists of Barovia, I really like the iteration of uh, second edition. And I'm going to quote uh, the book uh, Van Richten's uh, Guide to the Mists. So, uh, quote, Why do the mists continually create or ensnare creatures, places, and people? Why are the mists apparent servants of both good and evil? If the mists acted as a force of evil, then only evil would come forth from uh, their substance. This is clearly not the case. Uh, here, uh, Van Richten is uh, referencing uh, the goddess Ezra, who is a very prominent uh, deity in uh, classic uh, Ravenloft setting. Ezra, uh, some say that uh, the mists are a manifestation of the dark powers themselves, which is probably the case as they can fabricate uh, any kind of uh, perceived deity or uh, demon or whatever they can just do, whatever they want. But if that's the case, then how can clerics of Ezra, a deity that is uh, 
prominent in Ravenloft gains spells and protection from the mist. And how can they safely travel through mistways uh, inside the mist without uh, losing their life? So that's uh, up to the DM again, but I do really like the not so black and white iteration of uh, the fifth edition. The uncool answer is that they are actually the DM and how to guide the players uh, through the story of Kershostrad. But the cool answer, and indeed is, a vital part of Barovia, and uh, it's actually what makes Barovia whole, what keeps Strad in this place, what imprisonment the poor souls of the adventurers, what revives the souls of the Barovian people, and... Uh, What they really do is actually running the story forward. Question though, I think that the Vistani are the ones who can transfer between Ravenloft and uh, the material world. Or am I yeah. wrong? Uh, yeah, uh, in both that? the classical setting and the uh, new iteration, uh, they are they are portrayed as uh, otherworldly. Humanoids, uh, they appear to be human, but uh, I remember in the classic uh, Ravenloft setting, uh, there are a great many casts of uh, Vistani, uh, each with uh, their own traditions and uh, unique abilities. I do remember that uh, a faction of uh, Vistani tend to be able to kind of live outside of uh, time in uh, the Dem Plane of Dread. And uh, they are also free to roam the plains through the mists. So uh, it's uh, it's a mystery for me. Uh, I like to put it as a mystery. It's my only complaint for the book for 5e that there is no lore for the Vistani, as I remember in the Curse of Strad. I think uh, it's a kind of a sensitive uh, subject that uh, Vistani are very clearly portrayed as... Uh, Uh, real life uh, as real life people in uh, the second and third edition uh, there was a problem with uh, racial slurs in the books but uh, for me it was uh, it was okay because uh, that's very controversial but uh, second edition and Third edition uh, books in Ravenloft, as uh, Ravenloft Gazetteers and uh, Guides to the Vistani, were formed uh, as uh, um, stories and uh, histories from actual uh, NPCs inside uh, uh, Ravenloft. And uh, the Guide to the Vistani actually tells the story of uh, how Van Richten came to realize that he doesn't need to hate. The Vistani, as he was uh, very prejudiced against them because they, some of them committed uh, uh, very serious crimes against his uh, family. And uh, that's why he held a grudge. So it all makes sense in a story perspective. But yeah, the slurs are something like uh, not very acceptable today. Interesting, though. Yeah, but it shows that uh, he's just uh, human. And uh, racism uh, can be a part of uh, horror. It's a very horrifying aspect of the human experience. Um, but since we're talking about the Vistani, I was going to ask, can you explain to us how do curses work in this setting and why are they so important? And what is it about Barovia that makes it so easy to end up with a curse or a disease anyway? Curses in uh, Ravenloft are uh, deeply personal and uh, thematic. They often tie directly to a character's action or hubris, making them not just magical afflictions, but uh, moral punishments. Also, it's a way for the dark powers to corrupt individuals or uh, seduce someone as to, you know, uh, I will give uh, a test to someone you hate so that for uh, do this vile thing or whatever. Uh, for example, Strad's vampirism itself is a curse, and uh, it stems from his own tragic decisions. But obvious nature as a cursed land uh, makes it uh, very easy for characters to end up cursed, 
whether through dealing with Evistani, who have the ability to curse uh, other individuals, uh, meddling with uh, forbidden magic, or simply attracting the interest of the dark powers. These curses uh, add the layers to the story and force place to confront the consequences of their choices. And also, I think that the the whole vibe of the Curse of Strad is about negativity and evil. So, curses are quite stronger than they are in the real world. And also, ancient creatures living in Barovia, like hugs. And, you know, hugs and curses are usually a deadly duo. Okay, so... Um, while running this campaign, what did you decide to change about the canon lore to tailor it to your group's liking and theme? Uh, yeah, oh. sure. Uh, quite a few things, actually. Uh, from making uh, various organizations more active or manipulating the perceived time of uh, the players to outright sometimes try to gaslight the players, not the characters, into having doubts about their choices through in-game manifestations, like, uh, for example, um, NPCs uh, screwing around with information they otherwise wouldn't be able to to have, or uh, the dark powers' uh, ruthless and sadistic needs and will to do anything to corrupt the players. That's uh, very choice-based. You can adjust it to however you want to run your your game. Uh, Also, sometimes uh, serving the settings themes can turn uh, bleak, as previously mentioned, but of course, with the consent of the players, one can enforce various twists and manipulation in regards to the illusory nature of the demiplane of Dread. And for you, John? Uh, While I love Curse of Strad, I hated with my heart the werewolf den. I've read it like five times and still make no sense. Why is that? Because it's uh, quite complicated and the players have no reason to know the things that the NPCs know and to also understand the the whole story and to actually seem quite random. So it's complicated story-wise, or it's complicated and it's also random. I mean, yeah. uh, the story makes no sense actually. Why is that? Don't be afraid to spoil or anything because be- spoilers. Because players get between two werewolves, which uh, are actually the same person with a different name, and players have to make quick decisions with zero knowledge. So it's quite easily to make quotation the wrong uh, decision and that will affect the story later. And also the whole uh, mood of the, play- of the area is quite different from all the other places in Barovia. So I actually scrap it. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. Is it something that you can scrap? Without changing the narrative and the story, and I think uh, that you can scrap most of what uh, there is in the fifth edition uh, Curse of Strad because uh, it all kind of feels uh, disembodied to me. Uh, there is no real reason why things are mm-hmm. the way they are in Barovia, which is something I I disliked in the 5th edition because uh, in previous editions uh, the Barovia had a very rich history from when it was in the prime material plane. For example, uh, the saying that uh, Strad is the land, it quite literally means that Strad is the land as he can manipulate the land of Barovia to his will because uh, there were uh, some uh, very powerful face in Barovia called the Fames of Barovia, uh, which uh, Strad uh, actually enslaved and uh, gained uh, god- the godlike powers that he had. There is uh, this is also mentioned, I think, in uh, some of the books in the novels. I think that um, there is a story that uh, he summoned a very big tidal wave and uh, actually destroyed the whole village because uh, someone uh, killed the the current uh, incarnation of uh, Tatiana. But I'm not uh, quite sure which story this was. And, so, uh, in a way, he's figure. also a druid. 
he, he has he has <laughs> complete part. power over over the land. That's why he's the land. Also, he has complete control over the mists around Barovia. He is Barovia's no. druid. <laughs> he he's the god. He's uh, literally the god of Barovia. A circle he's of really the mists, like <laughs> figure of the mists or of the mess. <laughs> Both, I guess. But still, the other places in Barovia are more or less easily fixable. But uh, guys, scrap werewolf den. <laughs> <laughs> you make yourself a favor. That's a good advice. Indeed. Good thing to have in mind. Um, <laughs> I was also going to ask next, what was the hardest chapter to prepare and role play for both of you? Uh, we would probably agree on this. I think uh, Castro Ravelof, this place is huge to prepare. There are like 150 rooms with numerous traps weigh a lot NPCs, very hard encounters, and Strat can move freely whenever and wherever he wants. So it's quite in pain in the air. Yeah, he can literally go through walls, and uh, that's uh, up to the DM's imagination to to abuse. I mean, if I were Strad inside my castle, I would uh, drag them through the walls or whatever. He's a god. He's literally a god inside his castle. Is there any chance to get him to win Strad? Because, you know, you say that he's a god and he's so powerful. He manipulates the whole land because he is the land. So, you know, how how many possibilities um, there are to win Strad von Zarovich? I there... really think that uh, you shouldn't be able to win against Strad. I can't uh, fathom a way for new adventurers to be able to handle him or uh, his control over Barovia. And I don't think that's um, the point of Ravenloft. If uh, if we are playing the 5th edition iteration or uh, Tears of Strad, which is uh, the players need to escape, they want to escape, I think that uh, they should be able to do so but uh, I really don't like the Strad's portrayal in 5th edition. He's very weak, very weak. He's not a 12 uh, CR monster. He's literally a god. I, I'll say it again. But uh, that's the lore accurate Strad, and that's how I think uh, you should play around with him. Also, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't really see anyone as... Uh, An equal as an equal or uh, as a challenger because he knows he has total control. He's omnipotent and omnipresent in Barovia. And this is where I totally disagree with Yanis because I think, yes, you can win Strad. He has very obvious weaknesses. He has Tatiana, his love, and also his brother, Sergei, which if you can play your cards right, and also the whole concept of redeem and light. I strongly believe that you can win uh, Strad von Zarovic and also... And with the appropriate items, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> you can totally win Strad von Zarovic and why not escape uh, Barovia? Okay, so we have two different opinions, the light and the dark. You know, I love both of them, uh, actually, but the one that you, Yanni, said... I understand that Strad is so powerful and you're into his domain, so it makes a lot of sense yeah. not to get him. But on the other hand, is it fun for the players to play something that they know they're doomed to fail? Mm. Uh, I think that's the problem with uh, Gets of Strad and the 5th edition iteration of Ravenloft, because mm -hmm. it's really enclosed to the idea that uh, the mists uh, snatch you from another plane and they trap you without a reason without an obvious reason i mean it's up to the dm but uh, what i personally like about ravenloft is the general politics and the overall meta plot um in the classic setting the core uh, which is uh, the core of the demi plane of dread is actually connected and there's uh, history and uh, actual communication between the domains. There is uh, trade, there are domains that depend on other domains for food and uh, 
that means that uh, politics and war actually do have a reason to exist within that universe, uh, which is something that it's not the iteration of fifth edition. It's something quite different, which is totally a Jay on show. Uh, but uh, it's not an interwoven and uh, kind of alive world. So that's why I prefer the classic setting. But that's what made uh, Strad strong. He has no need for more uh, CR, more spells, more HP or anything like that. He has the the land and the mists, which not always act as Strad wants, but have a greater purpose. And mm. players have also these as enemies. Uh, ah, I don't like this iteration at all. I do really like the classic iteration where the Dark Powers actually help Strad to have total control over the mists in Barovia. And that's something that uh, every Dark Lord has. They have complete control over uh, the mists around uh, their domain, either knowing or not knowing. Some of the Dark Lords uh, have no idea that they are Dark Lords themselves. I think there are quite few characters uh, like Azalin and uh, Strad that actually do have an understanding of the nature of things, how things are run in the Dem Plane of Dread. Um, I do really like the concept that uh, Strad has this idea that he is God because he technically is, but he's a prisoner. And uh, I really like to play around with this idea. Also, I do really like the neighbor uh, politics that... Uh, take place. Um, at some point, uh, Barovia went to war with a neighboring uh, domain and actually consumed it in the classic setting, and uh, it now has uh, a very big uh, new portion of land. Yep, uh, you can add uh, way more things in the setting, because uh, sometimes may actually feel empty, but about the whole concept of strad and mists, I think it's way too one-sided for the players. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it just boils down to what uh, you and your players want to run. If you want something more heroic, then, of course, the the goal should be to escape Barovia and be able to to defeat Strad. So you, as the DM, need to give these tools to your players. But if you are on the more uh, political side or... Uh, uh, intricate plot side, I think the best way to go is the classic setting. But uh, I've run uh, actually a campaign with the 5th edition concept of uh, kind of scary Luna Park thing. And uh, it was totally fine and very fun for my players. Anyway, with both concepts, it's still very hard to defeat Strad, so don't underestimate him. Since we're talking for the final encounter... Other than that, what is your favorite encounter and why? I think my favorite encounter, it's probably the first encounter that has a really impact in the mood of Barovia, is uh, the Festival of the Blazing Sun in Valaki, where Strad and the vampire spawns try to steal the bones from a church in the middle of the festival. And this is where you really understand that Barovia is not a child play. People dying. The solutions that you may think may have the quite opposite result of what you're expecting. And that things are quite serious in Barovia. So it's a very impactful uh, encounter. What about you, uh, Yanis? I think uh, when I run 5th uh, edition Cares of Strad, my favorite and uh, most difficult encounter was the Night Hags Coven. Uh, it was a very brutal TPK, as uh, my players thought wow. it was a very good idea to camp outside the Hags lair. I was and... spectating this, uh, and yeah, that was... Man. <laughs> why? Just why? Uh, I mean, the hags just did what they did and they drained them uh, through their long rest. They prepared potions. Uh, they prepared uh, their lair. And uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, two to three hours real life in game fight. It was very challenging uh, as a DM. And, uh, but that was, uh, that was very intense. And uh, I think we really had fun with it. Fulfilling. Uh, yeah, kind of. But mm-hmm. it also kind of uh, 
took uh, the campaign to a very different direction than what I had in mind at start. But uh, the concept was that uh, ultimately Strad uh, needed the players because I have blended, uh, I had blended a uh, single edition uh, adventure as well, uh, and I was going to pit Barovia against a neighboring domain. So Strad really needed the players, so the TPK was uh, kind of superficial, mm -hmm. just to really scare them and uh, tell them, you know, if you take uh, silly decisions, then uh, silly things will happen. And the silly things did happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I think that no matter what you do, though, there are consequences, like you breathe and there are consequences somehow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it should, because uh, in Barovia, everyone wants to take advantage of you. If uh, they are a big player, they just need to take advantage of you. Just like the Hugs, they much uh, would like to to have the souls of the adventurers. But uh, Strad uh, really needed them, so that didn't happen. But uh, that had the consequence that then the Hugs had a grudge against Strad, but that uh, I never really managed to, to iterate in the story because uh, the campaign ended, unfortunately. But that's why Barovia is cool, because uh, all these gloomy concepts and consequences and fear what your next move is, is what makes good deeds uh, like candle in the darkness and that's uh, where true goodness truly shines so no it, it's not all dark and gloomy yeah i i really agree uh, i think it's uh, very central that uh, playing ravenloft uh, you put together that uh, hope is a very important aspect of the game it should exist and uh, Real goodness should exist within Ravenloft. That's so. I great. don't know about you, but I am just traumatized with every single time I've played <laughs> the Curse of Strat. <laughs> I can't see no hope whatsoever <laughs> any of the times I've played. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's uh, kind of part of it. I do really enjoy the, the helpless uh, aspect of uh, the game, but that's uh, playing with uh, people you trust. So, because uh, you can, in a horror setting, you can be really vulnerable uh, with uh, with your emotions and uh, the sense of dread. Sometimes it may pass uh, from the PC to to the player, and that's a fine line that uh, should be treaded uh, very carefully. But personally, I very much enjoy tragic stories, so I'm a sucker for it. Yeah, we're all suckers for it. <laughs> <laughs> and since you mentioned the sense of dread, I'm going to ask another question. Um, yeah. Can you both share with us a story from one of the times you run Ravenloft or Curse of Strahd? One that you will never forget. Yeah. Um, actually, it was uh, John uh, running uh, Curse of Strahd. I was playing uh, an assassin Hexblade human uh, named Doombray. He had uh, beef uh, with Rahadin the whole campaign as he killed uh, his love interest and uh, ended up uh, dying and uh, becoming a revenant, uh, cursed and uh, bound in Barovia to forever antagonize Strad and uh, Rahadin. I remember at the end of the campaign, uh, my character was uh, lured in a forest by Rahadin and through the shadows and uh, the mists, uh, along with uh, Strad's wolves, he decimated my character. Uh, he cut my tongue, uh, that means I couldn't cast uh, my spells, and he tear off my dominant hand, and that means I can't deal any damage, so it really broke my character. And as a result of that, uh, I've been, I have become uh, essentially useless. So my character decided to leave the party and actually go solo on the Amber Temple in hopes of finding a way to defeat Strad. It was uh, very dramatic and uh, very well suited at the given time. Oh, I love Dumbre. Yeah, he, I loved him too. <laughs> he was so great. And I still remember uh, this RP you had with um, 
our friend who played Rahadin, because there were so many people that came through uh, this campaign. Yeah. And one of them was playing uh, actual the actual Rahadin. And this friend of ours uh, looks like Rahadin, to be honest, with yeah, his long the only, hair. The only thing missing is the ears. Yeah. <laughs> Pun not intended. <laughs> <laughs> so they had such a great... RP moment together and Yanis was was sweaty and he was out of control at that Man, time. He really gone through my nerves. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I remember you. Your eyes were wide open. You were barely screaming. <laughs> yeah, I actually hated his character. I really hated his RP in, uh, in the best way possible. If that makes sense, it was uh, really awesome. What about you, John? I have many favorite moments, but I think the moments that reflect best the concept of Barovia is uh, from one of my characters, I was the DM. It involves a character called Barnes, whose class was Bannerman, something like a paladin. He entered Barovia by sacrificing himself in the death house uh, on the first episode. Uh, for some reason, later... In this campaign, he was resurrected. After spending several days in the village of Barovia, he was exhausted from insomnia because uh, in Barovia it is quite difficult to sleep. Uh, he found an old lady in the village of Barovia who gave him a pill in order to sleep. A weird pill. That seems dangerous. No, no. Was it? A totally innocent pill. Okay, that was surely dangerous. He couldn't sleep for several days, as I said. And at the fifth day, I think, where you die from exhaustion, he was seriously thinking to take the pill. Uh, his god took pity on him. And when he was ready to take it, so that he would not die, the room, eliminated with a huge glow, Stopping him from doing so and resting him completely. The light that illuminated the room was reflected from the windows, which was noticed by Irina, who had not met her until now and gave her hope that this place can change and that someone can illuminate Barovia. Oh, that was so great. I remember that time. Actually... I personally, in this campaign, because I have played with the with the guys, um, I used to play as Irina Koliana, the reincarnation of Tatiana, and uh, I made her a cleric of life, light, I don't remember. I think light, but I'm not sure. Um, I think life. Because, life. Uh, uh, yeah, light clerics uh, had fireball, and uh, I do oh, remember yeah. you cast fireballs. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I was healing the whole time. So, um, Irina was a believer of Lathander, a long forgotten god, and she believed that the light will eventually, um, come back, uh, to Borovia. And that was so amazing because I remember that time when, um, our friend, the Bannerman, was in his room and a light came through the window into the darkness. And at that time, Irina was out, uh, spreading some um, papers that she was writing poems um, of light and that the light will come again to give hope to the people of um, uh, Barovia and you know she was trying to hold her faith strong but she would feel very disappointed with all of this stuff happening and when she saw this light coming through the window from her fellow adventurer it was such a relief because she would be like oh my god it's true maybe this man can save this um cursed place but in the end he didn't and the chosen light was irina herself to be honest and she stayed true to the light till the end and yeah i think that that was pretty amazing and I also loved that moment when Yannis uh, find out that his uh, romantic interest, another fellow player, another uh, friend of ours, uh, was dead by vampires. 
and he tried to t- save her. He tried actually to bring her back, but she was cursed, and she came back as a vampire spawn without her mind, mindless completely. He killed her, and it was such a heartbreaking moment because I remember you putting your sword down and crying yeah. and felt so. You know, it was the beginning of your downfall in that moment. Yeah. I, if I remember correctly, it was uh, Strad's wives who turned her yeah. into a vampire spawn. Uh, she was actually playing a paladin, and Rahadin took her sword and defiled it later on, which uh, drove my character to actually hate him so much. Yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, I remember the continuation, because later on you came back and you told us what happened. And then we go on search for these vampires and the place was very dark and misty, but, you know, the magical darkness. And I remember, Irina, I would cast Dispel Magic and the mists were banished for for a second. And then another friend of ours who was playing a druid uh, would cast Tsunami on them because apparently vampires were... Tidal Wave. Not tidal tsunami. wave. Tsunami oh, is yeah, a yeah, yeah. Ninth level spell. You're right. Uh, tidal wave. And then the mists would come back together. And then Irina would cast the spell magic again. And, you know, for two or three rounds, uh, it would play the same and same uh, scene again and again. It was very, very powerful. Yeah, I had actually spiked uh, very well, uh, if I remember correctly, with uh, Hexblade. And I was able to. To solo one of the yeah. one of Strad's wives, and uh, you guys just dispelled the magic, uh, dispelled the mist, and uh, you threw guiding bolts uh, through it. Then the mist uh, just came back together. It was very cinematic. That was amazing. I think I'm just gonna add the story as well, but um, it's completely different because it's not actually an in-game story that I will never forget. <laughs> okay, <laughs> share with um, us. It completely traumatized me to this day. It was our first session. Um, it was the death house. I'm sure it was. So we were all at mine and we lit so many candles, turned the lights off. And I think I made mulled wine, whatever. So we were drinking wine as well. Uh, there was like incense in the air. It was all really mystical and spooky. Um, so after an intense role-playing moment of Yanis, because you were the DM, you suddenly felt really unwell in real life. But yeah. <laughs> until, until we re- realized that you weren't actually role-playing. Yeah. I feel I... so bad about this. We thought you were role-playing the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I actually have no recollection of the moment. I I'm glad. Actually, I'm really I, glad. I only remember moments uh, before <laughs> uh, before the it was a, happened. It was a great role-playing moment, though, nevertheless. <laughs> yeah, it was. If they didn't understand that you weren't role-playing, that means you were role-playing very well. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. But you were uh you're both wonderful DMs. I didn't have the opportunity to play with Yanis as a DM, uh to be honest, but I have spectated his game for Ravenloft and it was great. So they are both amazing in this world, in their own different styles, but I love both of them. It depends on what you want to play. So uh, I don't think I have anything to mention other than that. Uh, do you have anything to add to say to our audience? No, that, no only that I strongly recommend play Curse of Strad. It's a quite unique experience for DMs and players alike. And I want to thank my players for giving me the opportunity to play as a DM in our Curse of Strat. It was probably my favorite campaign and uh, love you all, guys. <laughs> oh, thank you. That made me emotional. <laughs> what about you, Yannis? Have you got anything to say before we leave? I mean, the end goal is to have fun and that's uh, up to you and your players. Um, 
if you want something uh, thematically more simple, you can go with fifth edition. If you want uh, something more fleshed out, uh, an iteration of Ravenloft that uh, actually uh, gives you the idea that uh, you really live inside these domains and uh, that you are just some guy. You, it's uh, it's the best way to go. But that's all up to you. Both uh, versions have their merits and uh, have fun. Great. So it was a pleasure. But before we close, I want to mention that Yanis Swerdev is not the first time actually you uh, hear about him and yes. you listen to him, to be honest. Uh, you have listened to him uh, because he played the, the role of uh, Darian Shadow Swift and Echo. And also, he is a very super duper talented, I have no words, uh, composer. And he has composed so much music for our podcast. And we are so grateful to him. And Thank you. really, you haven't even listened to anything yet. Trust me on this. We will insert his links down in the description box. So make sure to go and check him out, please. Please. I think Thank you, you should. I think you all should. Thank you very but much. I also think that we should wrap this up now. Yeah. Um we thank you so much to both of you for being here with us. We hope everyone enjoyed this episode as much as we did. So let us know what your Halloween costume will be this year. We're always curious to know. So until next time, may all your roles be a natural 20. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.